on variant surges in the UK. Anybody who has something that really matters to them, concentrate on that thing and then build out from there, rather than just accepting every invitation and going to every bit of work uh, in person. Clinical studies are showing that lots of people are getting reinfected uh, with Omicron who previously had been vaccinated or had a combination of vaccines and natural infection. So it definitely is likely to bypass some of the ability to reduce, in, uh, reduce infection. Meanwhile, there are calls for support for the hospitality sector as customers cancel bookings. Some in the industry are predicting significant falls in footfall in December as COVID cases rise. Many customers are now avoiding socialising in the build-up to Christmas over fears of having to isolate. Business groups are calling for an extension of the VAT reduction, which is due to end in March, and for business rates to be deferred. The Queen has cancelled her traditional pre-Christmas family lunch next week. It's understood the decision was a precautionary measure because it could affect many people's Christmas arrangements if it went ahead. A man has accepted responsibility for the killing of primary school teacher Sabina Nessa, but has pleaded not guilty to murder. Kochi Selamash killed the 28-year-old as she walked through a South London park on the way to meet a friend on September the 18th. The prosecution alleged he travelled to London from his home in Eastbourne to carry out a premeditated and predatory attack. He'll face a further hearing in February. Two people are missing after a block of flats was gutted by fire in a suspected arson attack. After an extensive search, Thames Valley Police say it doesn't expect there to be any more survivors in the fire, which started in the early hours of yesterday morning. One person has been confirmed dead after the blaze. A 31-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of murder and arson. At least four children have died and more are badly injured in Australia after strong winds lifted a bouncy castle during end-of-year school celebrations. Two boys and two girls in their final year of primary school died in Tasmania after the children's ride flew away, causing them to fall 10 metres. Five more children are in hospital, including one in a serious condition. Young children on a, a fun day out together with their families and it turns to such horrific tragedy. At this time of year, it just breaks your heart. UK authorities are responding to several incidents involving small boats in the English Channel. Border force and lifeboats have already intercepted several inflatables and landed more than 100 people in Dover this morning. Our home and security editor Mark White witnessed the latest arrival of migrants in Dover Harbour. It is another day of significant migrant activity uh, in the Channel and that, the reason for that is that conditions are very calm out in the channel at the moment. We've had about 10 days of pretty atrocious weather where no small boats have been able to make it across. But now that weather conditions have improved, there's a window of about two or three days, we're expecting a lot of migrant activity. Mark White reporting there. Well, that's all your news for now. I'll have more in half an hour. Now it's back to Gloria. Coming up this hour on The Briefing, what a year it's been. We're taking an in-depth look back over the political stories that hit the headlines in 2021. Yes, we're talking Partygate, Sleaze, Matt Hancock and more with two top lobby journalists. Pippa Creera, political editor of The Mirror and Christopher Hope, chief political correspondent of The Telegraph. Free period products can now be provided in schools by schools, but often they're not. I'll be talking to the Labour MP campaigning to improve provision. And after many moving and sometimes heartbreaking interviews with MPs, it's Christmas, so we have a jolly one with Labour MP Siobhan McDonough. Two weeks from the end of 2021, what an incredible year it's been. Covid is sweeping the country again and we're worried about Christmas again. MPs go home for the holidays today, so let's take a look back. I'm delighted to be joined by two of Britain's top political journalists and incredible scoop getters, Pippa Creera, political editor of The Mirror, and Christopher Hope, chief political correspondent and assistant editor at The Telegraph. Welcome to you both. 
We're going to start, Pippa, with you, if I may. Absolutely, Gloria. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. And we're delighted to have you on, Pippa. Now, here's a question I want to ask you. You have broken all the party <laughs> stories, but you, The Mirror is a very Labour-supporting newspaper. You're probably not going to answer this, but how on earth are you getting these scoops which look like they're inside jobs? Well, it depends what you mean by inside jobs. I think, um, as Chris, I'm sure, would agree, the longer you've been around Westminster, and I've been around 20 years um, in the lobby on and off, you get to know people from all parties. And, you know, that includes, um, uh, you know, Labour and the Conservatives. You know aides, you know insiders, you know advisors, and you know politicians themselves. And for many years, I worked for the Evening Standard, which, of course, um, was the London newspaper when Boris Johnson was mayor, and got to know the Prime Minister um, and the team around him pretty well as well. Now, my newspaper might be big supporters of the Labour Party, but I see myself first and foremost as a journalist there to hold those in power to account, regardless of their political persuasion. And you can bet your bottom dollar, Gloria, that if Labour ever make it back to power and if I'm still at the mirror, I'll be, doing the, I'll be paying the same attention to them. The party stories that you've uncovered, are these the biggest scoops of your career, Pippa? Well, it's been a, it really been a very it's been an incredible couple of years, hasn't it? We've had the coronavirus pandemic, which has kind of shifted the way we all work in journalism and obviously beyond. Um, but yes, probably the Dominic Cummings story back uh, last year of Dominic Cummings breaching the the lockdown rules and going to uh, Barnard Castle, um, uh, which which obviously provoked a huge backlash. Uh, early on in the pandemic, and then laterally the last few weeks with these stories about breaches at number 10. But certainly there were those which seemed to have pressed a button with the public most, and that's how I would define big scoops, which ones kind of cut through with the public and, and sort of make people feel something or make people engage with politics. Um, there have been lots of others on the, along the way, of course, which have, which have kind of had an impact in Westminster, but less out with it. And I, I always try with my political journalism to to cover stories that I think matter to people out there in the real world. Chris, it has cut through, hasn't it, all these it has. parties? How damaging or long-term is the damage I, to the Conservative I mean, party? Pippa's done a great job there, and there's no question that people take her those stories. They know the mirror will do them properly. And I think that the, the sleeve, the recent stuff, the recent the parties, that really exploded when we saw that, that, that video come out from, the, from this uh, Legra Stratton um, uh, press conference. That's when it changed the whole dynamic. Let's take a look at that video. I've just seen reports on Twitter that there was a Downing Street Christmas party on Friday night. Do you recognise those reports? <laughs> I went home. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. Um, uh, uh... Would the Prime Minister condone uh, having a Christmas? What's the answer? I don't know. I didn't... Wasn't the party? It was cheese and wine. Just be clear, it's not. <laughs> is cheese and wine all right? No. It was a business no. meeting. <laughs> I'm joking. This is recorded. This fictional party was a business meeting. <laughs> and it was not socially distanced. Mm. The video you would you just raised, uh, Chris. Yes, I mean that, that completely because the problem is the Tory government has put itself involved in all of our lives with lockdown restrictions, and what we can't stand, anyone can't stand, is them almost mocking those rules that they're enforcing on us. It's all very well you and I joking about them in our private lives, going, oh, I've got to meet the neighbour over a fence who in the in different gardens, have a drink with them, or something something mad like that, like last Christmas. But to see that kind of that mocking, that sort of sneering at these rules was just too much, I think, and that's what what turned what, what been a series of really good stories from the mirror, I think, into a national conversation about the double standards in, in, in Whitehall. And the mirror has been doing it since then, that the other parties at the, the central office, the picture of them all having, having a good time with Sean Bailey. He's apologised, he's quit a role in City Hall. Um, it's, it's really, it's just not, not easy. That I'm, and I think this idea of, of one rule for them, one rule for us has really cut through at the end of the year. Yes, Pippa, to, to, to come back to you, when I saw the party at Conservative HQ, that one seemed to me as the biggest breach of any guidelines. Clearly, political apparatchiks are not key workers. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, but I do think Chris is the point with that video, and I think it was the same with this story. The Times actually reported the story about the CCHQ party last week, and it, you know, it gained some traction, but but really more of the focus was on number 10 and, and other departmental breaches. Um, and then we got hold of a picture of that party. And then suddenly, again, it really took off. And I think there's something about having 
the visual imagery, not just as proof to people that these things happened, but also which actually shows, you know, give them the, sort of the inside view, if you like, of what was actually going on in, the, in that room. And there was 24 people crowded together for a photo, raising glasses, uh, wearing festive hats and jumpers. And they're laid out at one side of the picture was a, what looked like a catered spread. There was so much kind of detail that people could see for themselves what was going on. And don't forget that this is the time we were banned under tier two rules in London from socially mixing with others with other households so you know let alone this debate that's going on at the moment about not having christmas parties you couldn't even have you know a drink indoors with a family member and then of course it, it also sort of kind of reopens wounds for lots of people as to what then happened when christmas was cancelled and they had to make big sacrifices and not be with loved ones over for over for what for many people is the most important time of year and Chris, there's not going to be a police investigation, no. will that hold? But a cabinet secretary investigation, is that enough? That's imminent, I think, the Simon Case investigation. The police won't investigate breaches of health regulations that no one actually knew. And when Dominic Raab first said that about 10 days ago on the TV, mm. everyone thought, well, can't you, you can't sort of forecast crimes. Why can't you look back into them? It seems that the health ones, particularly, the, the Met do not look back into, despite the evidence done, covered by ITV News, despite Pippa's reporting. It's odd that, but perhaps the police have got bigger things to look at. You can argue that. This really is a political story. I don't see it as a police story. It's a political one. It's double standards. You know, it's terribly damage, damaging uh, for, for, for the government. And last word to you on, on this, Pippa. How do you feel about no police investigation? Well, they've put their, they've explained why they don't do it. Um, I think Chris is right that it's going to end up being political. Certainly the, the um, allegations around uh, what's happened in government. But I, would, I wouldn't hold your breath. I mean, I do, I, I do wonder um, about the case investigation. I mean, they're looking at four breaches. Let's see how those turns out. He said, the Prime Minister said that if they uncover any evidence of breaches, they, they would hand it over to the police. And if the police are handed evidence by government, and they clearly have evidence about what's happening at CCHQ, um, then you know, they're, they're in quite a difficult position because there are cases of retrospective um, investigations into coronavirus breaches. However, they are tiny in number. Um, but you know, ultimately, I think the bigger picture here is that, as Chris rightly says, it's, a, it's a, the political fallout of it. The public will act, really, as both the judge and the jury here, and the public hate double standards. Now, the next story you both ch uh, chose was the story of sleaze, which has been a big one this year. Uh, Chris, I'm going to start with you. And you both phrased it in different ways, actually, which was interesting. So you phrased it, Owen Patterson quits after backlash from MPs. Why was that one of the most memorable moments? You. It was a massive misjudgment. I mean, all, politics is all about how do you judge your support in Parliament? And they just got it wrong. I mean, the Chief Whip and others have been trying to find a way to reform the rules of our M MP standards that you'll remember and you're from the old days when you were an MP. It's all about whether there was a, a no right of appeal when you were being looked at by, by the system. And the idea was to bring it, bring a, bring it, make it, give it more of a kind of, you can come back if you're being investigated. They thought the Owen Patterson case would allow a degree of, um, of sympathy because oh, wow. of what happened to his wife. Um, and then, of course, uh, they mi massively misjudged it and went, uh, went quite hard on that, trying to whip MPs to support it. But when backbench Tory MPs saw it, they thought, well, why are we doing this? And also, because uh, a third of the Tory party was elected in 2019, be they barely knew Owen Patterson and wondered why they're risking all this pressure on social media for doing this. And that's why it rebounded quite badly on the government. And would you say that was the moment when Conservative MPs started... Feeling a bit grumpy with the Prime Minister. Yeah, <clears throat> there are two groups of Tory MPs. You've got the, 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 the cohort in the South who have massive uh, majorities who are never going to be unseated at the next election. But you now have a significant number of people who just won their seats in the North and, and the, the Midlands of, of England. They are very worried about the next election. They're worried how it looks. They are fighting for their livelihoods in a bit over two years' time. I think the, the election is in, in May 24. And it's those individuals who are really concerned. And that's, where, that's the division you're seeing in the Tory party. One, one half can maybe tolerate it. They know Owen from way back. The newer group are not happy. And they're still not happy, as we saw this week. Pippa, uh, the way you phrased it was two words. Tory sleep. <laughs> Is it as simple as that? <laughs> 
Well, um, <laughs> because ultimately, uh, what ended up what we all ended up doing was looking into examples, uncovering examples of cases where, for example, MPs of high paid second jobs where they were abroad. Jeffrey Cox, obviously, being a notable example, where they were abroad, uh, given permission to miss votes. Um, so that they could take on lucrative business elsewhere. All of this was within the rules, but um, you know the rules were at fault. And the sort of the comparison which lots of people made was with the expenses scandal um, back um, a decade ago, where the rules were set, but um, although there were some subsequently some criminal convictions um, for fraud, but the vast majority of MPs that used the system were sticking within the rules. It's just that they. Frankly, weren't uh, you know weren't good enough, and um, the public was outraged by some of the things that that were uncovered. Same time this time, you know, we had a couple of weeks where there was all these stories um, where predominantly Tory MPs, and I think it was, it was certainly in terms of like the second jobs for consultancy, it was something like eighteen or nineteen Tory MPs and one Labour MP um, and one Lib Dem um, were caught up in this in this row about what was the appropriate use of their time. And number 10, really under pressure after that initial own goal that Chris described to justify how it's okay for MPs to, in some cases, earn hundreds of thousands of pounds for outside work when their priority should be for their constituents. Um, and, you know, there was public anger about it. There was, as Chris rightly says, this sort of split in the Conservative Party. And it became, to me, the, the start of a, a five or six week period, kicked off a five or six week period where number 10 has been very much on the back foot. So went straight on into sort of the levelling up rows about um, social care and um, and Northern Rail infrastructure investment. And then we got on to, on to the sort of rise about double standards and parties. And um, when you consider that it was just two years ago this weekend that the Prime Minister won a stonking majority, a historical defeat of the Labour Party um, um, to get into power. And then you see him now really plummeting in the polls. I think it raises big questions about whether his backbenchers regard him as an electoral asset or an electoral liability. And on that bombshell, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go to a short break. Much more to come from Pippa and Christopher in just a moment. Remember that video of Matt Hancock kissing his aide in the office? One scene never forgotten <laughs> with that story and so much more in just a moment. For that, it's your weather. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello. Most will have a dry day today and um, several more dry days to come as well. Lots of cloud around, not a huge amount of sunshine. The winds are fairly light, so that cloud isn't really moving too far, all thanks to an area of high pressure. There is this weather front dangling across the far north of Scotland that will bring some rain at times to Shetland, so a bit damp and drizzly here. But otherwise, as I said, the vast majority dry. Quite a lot of cloud across Wales, southern England, but we do have some sunshine across eastern England, eastern parts of Scotland. We've had some morning fog as well, and that is taking a while to clear away. Mostly cloudy, but dry across Northern Ireland too. Temperature-wise, well, generally still above average, well above across the south, 11, 12 degrees Celsius. But it is going to turn colder over the next few days. Certainly tonight, under clear skies across the east, temperatures will fall away and we will see some thickening fog patches once more. Could be quite dense by the morning, the fog over parts of eastern England, so something to be aware of for Friday morning's commute. Some breaks in the cloud across West Wales and eastern Scotland, certainly allowing some pockets of frost. Uh, but generally where it stays cloudy, temperatures holding up at 6 or 7 Celsius. On to Friday, and again, dry and cloudy does kind of sum it up, but there will be some good spells of sunshine over northern Scotland. West Wales should be generally dry and bright, the north coast of Devon and Cornwall. Further east, pretty grey and dank, I suspect, across eastern England. Some of that fog likely to last all day, and if it does, well, we'll struggle to get to 7 or 8 Celsius. Generally, temperatures just a degree or so down on today's values. Through Friday evening, not a great deal of change. Again, where we've got some clear skies, temperatures will fall sharply and we could see some more fog patches forming. And that's how we go into the weekend, really. That high pressure we saw at the start is still with us. So a lot of dry weather, but a lot of cloudy weather, mist and fog getting thicker through the weekend and also things turning colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. I'm Darren McCaffrey and join me on The Briefing Monday to Thursday at 3pm 
You'll get your afternoon fix of all the latest political stories, debate and analysis, as well as interviews with some of the biggest names in UK politics. It's a problem that affects the whole world, Darren. From Westminster to Cardiff, Edinburgh and Belfast, if it's happening in UK politics, we've got it covered. That's The Briefing with me, Darren McCaffrey, Monday to Thursday, 3pm on GB News. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics <laughs> because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for the political correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is the political correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. Welcome back. The Mirrors, Pippa Carrera and The Telegraph's Chris Hope are still with me. Chris, you chose Matt Hancock as one yes. of your stories of the year. Yes. Tell us why. It's on the theme of double standards when he was caught in a, can we call it a clinch at midday on a, I think a, on a Thursday? Okay. A clinch is fine. <laughs> with, with his, uh, well, we had a colleague uh, in his office because the, the camera was on his door and it was leaked by someone to a tabloid newspaper. And that was a moment at which I think a real, a real moment when, you know, why are we being told to do these things by Matt Hancock? Of course, with all the best intention. But in his, in his private life, he's there, you know, with someone not in his own household. And that really annoyed people. I think yet, yet again, that also, well, damaged Matt Hancock, he had to resign. Um, damaged, you know, the whole government messaging. And again, you know, I think it's just one, one rule for one, them, one rule for us. And that goes back to the MP expenses scandal, I think, as Pippa referenced earlier. It's all about, you know, I think in, nowadays in public life, you've got to be squeaky clean, both in your private life and on your public life. Mm. I don't know if that's squeaky. I mean, squeaky. Not squeaky. Like, I'm a, but I, but this, this was like. I'm not judging morally, not... by the way. I'm clear. I'm not judging morally on this because I think we can't judge morally on private lives. We've all got different private lives. But the, well, they were saying you can't do this with someone outside your household. Yeah, I know. I you know can't that. mix. And he was I clearly, yeah. let's call it mixing. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a look, actually. <laughs> I've been to see the Prime Minister to 
resign as Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. I understand the enormous sacrifices that everybody in this country has made, that you have made, and those of us who make these rules have got to stick by them, and that's why I've got to resign. Let's talk to <laughs> Pippa Crera. That was a very contrite Matt Hancock, and Matt Hancock, who clearly worked hard during the start of the pandemic, and a Matt Hancock who clearly would like to be rehabilitated. He's doing a lot of uh, public uh, interviews and things. Can he be rehabilitated, Pippa? Well, I think what's really interesting is the initial his initial response to the revelations. And they stand out to me in stark contrast to other examples that we've seen since the start of the pandemic. So, for example, when we broke the Dominic Cummings story, um, number 10 initially stonewalled, obfuscated, didn't want to tell us what had actually gone on. We ended up with that really quite remarkable um, press conference in the Downing Street Garden with Dominic Cummings. And it kind of stretched on and on and on. Um, and MPs were calling for him to go and all sorts. Uh, a similar issue here with the, the parties rise and, and the fact that number 10 appeared to be doubling down on them until they're actually presented with sort of visual evidence of, of them happening. The difference with Matt Hancock is that initially the Prime Minister tried to do that, sweep it under the carpet, say he was standing by him, very much his, his modus operandi. But um, it became apparent that public anger was, because of the double standards, which Hancock references there, was, was too great. And so Matt Hancock fell on his sword and, um, and, and quit. And I think that the fact that he left quickly, the fact that, as you rightly say, Gloria, he was contrite, um, would put him in a position for a comeback at some point in future, were it not for the fact that actually um, the Tory MPs, Tory party, are quite divided on Hancock and felt that he'd been, there's a wing of the Conservative Party that felt he'd kind of been captured by the scientists, if you like, during the first and second waves of the coronavirus crisis when he was health secretary. I always felt that he was very measured and listened to, um, to you know, both the sort of the political, um, the, the, you know, the sort of the, how people felt politically, but also um, to what the science was and didn't, and didn't ignore that. And I thought that was very important, but that got the backs up of many in his party. So, um, you know, I'm not sure we're going to see another leadership bid by Matt Hancock in the future, but certainly I think he would like to make a, uh, he's an ambitious man who'd make, like to make a comeback to the front line. Come back. He, he may want to. Uh, he's doing interviews and he's enthusiastic. I mean, he worked really hard. In, in, the pressure on him was in, intense. He made a mistake. I thought the Hancock, what was interesting about the Hancock affair was the way that Boris Johnson misread the mood. As Pippa alluded to there, he stood, he, he, he's very loyal actually to people, but he didn't quite, you know, he's this magic politician who had the mind, this magic touch, and he knew what people thought, and a populist and politician, and he misread that one and didn't say, Matt, on your bike early. And it mm -hmm. took and took the reaction. I remember listening to on the BBC programme called, called Any, Any Answers, which is a, a phone in. All the calls were about Matt Hancock. Why hasn't he gone yet? It was almost like the, like the MP expense scandal. He failed to read the room, Boris Johnson, and we're seeing that recently, I think, by re reading the room in his own in his own front room with with his Tory MPs. He's he's just he's just trying to feel for his political touch, I think, this year, and he hasn't found it yet. Quite interesting. Mm, it is. Um, we are going to move on to um, your final two stories, Pippa. You chose the Capitol Hill riots. Why? <laughs> Well, I know that it's not a UK domestic story, but to me, it kind of bookended the Donald Trump administration, um, obviously in, in an incredibly dramatic way. Um, we had Donald Trump refusing to accept the election results, which found that Joe Biden had won the US presidential election and uh, both tweeting allegations of voter fraud that morning and then giving that very incendiary speech in which he said, we fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Crowds of uh, right-wing uh, supporters, including um, the, the Proud Boy movement, a sort of a, a semi, uh, I guess I'm not quite sure how you describe them, but certainly um, not, not a peaceful movement, um, a, a, a walk towards the Capitol, waving flags and weapons, shouting out, fight for Trump. And then they stormed the Capitol. And, you know, for many people uh, right across the world, that image there that you've got of the, of, of the capital there, Gloria, is kind of like um, a symbol of, of democracy. Uh, America 
has always sort of stood proud in its tradition and its reputation as being a um, defender of democracy globally. I'm sure we could have long debates about whether that's actually the case, but certainly that's how it's always been projected. And after four years of a t Trump presidency, which was incredibly di divisive, not just in America, but globally, um, this is all sort of culminating in this huge moment, um, seemed to me like one of, you know, the, one of the most dramatic uh, political moments of the decade, not just of the year. It obviously resulted in Trump's impeachment for the second time, um, although that was, that was then, he was then acquitted by the Senate, a criminal investigation into hundreds of people. There were deaths and many injuries as a result of it, big security concerns for Joe Biden's inauguration. And I think it's left everybody with a sort of an ongoing fear of what could happen when democracies go wrong. And so I think it's something that we, you know, we shouldn't forget those images. Thank you, Pippa. Chris Hope, you broke this story in May. Billions for Scots as Boris Johnson plans spending spree to save the union. How's it going? Well, big roads are being planned. Uh, they want to try and uh, do a connectivity issue, try, try and connect the different nations in, in, in the UK. There's a big worry for Boris Johnson, and everyone thought that it would be the union that might bring him down. He's so unpopular in, in, in Scotland, and the big concern is what can happen, you know, what will happen next if they can't secure Scotland. Um, but, of course, other issues now are coming into play. But I still think that the issue, the long-term issue of the union, the threat of, of a poll, a vote um, by, the, by the Scottish National Party, I think that's the big existential issue for Boris Johnson and probably for the Tory party. If they lose Scotland, it's a complete disaster. Um, and the idea is spending money, UK money, in Scotland to show the benefit of the union. And that started just after the May elections, which I'm referring to there, and let's see how it goes on this year. That's the big story over the next 18 months, Scotland. The Telegraph's Chris Hope and The Mirror's Pippa Creera, thank you not just for being on the show today, but for providing us with brilliant journalism <laughs> this year and for all thank your you. careers. Thank you. In a moment, I'll be talking period products in schools with Labour MP for Brentford and Isleworth, Ruth Cadbury. I'll have a very jolly real me interview as it's Christmas with Siobhan McDonough, Labour MP from Richmond Morden. That's after the news. Good afternoon, I'm Tamsin Roberts. Here are the latest headlines. British tourists and business travellers will be banned from entering France from Saturday due to the rise in the Omicron variant in the UK. The French government announced that only French nationals, their families and British citizens living in the country will be allowed in. Those that can enter will also have to self-isolate for seven days, but isolation will be lifted after 48 hours if their test is negative. Travel industry groups have called the move a hammer blow to their Christmas season. And a man has accepted responsibility for the killing of primary school teacher Sabina Nessa, but has pleaded not guilty to murder. Kochi Salamaji killed the 28-year-old as she walked through a South London park on the way to meet a friend on September the 18th. The chief medical officer has warned people to deprioritise certain social events ahead of Christmas to help prevent against the spread of coronavirus. Professor Chris Whitty warned that multiple records will be broken over the coming weeks as the Omicron variant surges in the UK. On Wednesday, daily Covid cases hit over 78,000, the highest since the pandemic began. The Queen has cancelled her traditional pre-Christmas family lunch next week. It's understood the decision was a precautionary measure because it could affect many people's Christmas arrangements if it went ahead. While well, you're right up to date, I'll be back with more on today's news stories at the top of the hour. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. 
This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Welcome back. The government funds free period products in schools, but not all schools have signed up. And a report found that one in 14 girls miss school due to period poverty. Ruth Cabre, Labour MP and chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Period Equality, raised this yesterday in a Westminster debate. And she joins me in the studio now. Welcome to the show, Ruth. Lovely um, to be here. Nice to see you again, Nice Gloria. to see you. So you held this debate in Parliament yesterday. The government have introduced this scheme, so presumably praise and credit where credit is due. Yes, no, the Department for Education have been providing this scheme for a couple of years now. Uh, it follows on from a, a voluntary scheme uh, called the Red Box Scheme that was run by charity. So it's really good that the government has taken it up um, and we're encouraging them to uh, keep it going. Um, uh, as you said, uh, a lot of schools, uh, a, a lot of girls miss school because they're on their period. Now, sometimes that's just because of period pains and, and, and so on. But for too many youngsters, it's, it's about availability uh, of period products uh, and an increasing number of uh, children are saying they can't afford to buy uh, tampons or pads or, or, or whatever they need. And, um, you know, so, so this scheme does help a lot in terms of ensuring that cost I is not an issue. And just tell us how many secondary schools have signed up and... Well, this is an England scheme, yeah. and about 70% of UK schools have taken it up, but there is an, uh, an imbalance of schools. Only 41% of primary schools you, have signed up. Can you and do it in primary schools? Mm -hmm. do, do, would you well, um, I mean, uh, girls are starting menstruating earlier and earlier, right. um, you know, from when, from when, when we were. Uh, um, nine, um, nine years old is, oh. is, is increasingly uh, a starting age, and certainly years five and six, you will get girls uh, coming onto their periods. And of course, if it's their first period and they, they come on in school, that's really scary, if, particularly if they come from a family that doesn't talk about periods. So to have the, the to have products available, plus uh, a staff member who has some empathy and some sympathy with what these girls are going through, um, I think is really important. So that even in primary schools, there needs to be a box available and someone to, to, to support them where they can just quietly go and, and pick up what they need. That's interesting that you say quietly, because when I was thinking about this and thinking about free period products in schools, I was thinking, gosh, but imagine having to go up and say, sort of, miss, I'm, I'm, I can't afford to get my own yeah. tampons or, um, or, or pads. But it's not like that. That's not how it operates. Well, I, I mean, it'll operate differently in different schools and, of course, it applies in colleges as well. But, uh, I, I mean, on the one hand, yes, there needs to be discretion, but also, I think, knowing that there's an adult to talk to, um, particularly if, if uh, you're not expecting uh, to even start your periods or you've got particular pains or problems or you're worried about it. But also, I mean, we, the, 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 there are three uh, issues. I mean, uh, Plan International UK talked about a toxic trio around uh, period equality, uh, for, for, and particularly for girls in schools. Um, poverty in, in, and, and the ability to afford 
and get access to, 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 to products, but also education. All young people, boys and girls, need to talk about, need to learn about periods, need to talk about them openly and, and, and uh, you, you, you know, respectfully. And then there's the stigma, and, and you know, too often there is still a stigma about menstruation, and we need to get over that as well. So knowing that there is a, a, a supply in school, knowing where it is, is all part of talking about periods, which you know, all helps. I mean, this is a normal, natural body, bodily function, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't make girls feel shamed and shameful because they've come on their period. We've got about 30 seconds okay. at, um, left. Just want to ask you whether you are following... Chris Whitty's advice and deprioritizing your pre-Christmas socialising. Yeah, well, um, I have a fairly quiet social life anyway. Uh, um, but uh, no, we, we've uh, a couple of friends um, have, have cancelled uh, events. We're going to keep it really quiet. And the real sacrifice, my husband has told me that he may not go to the football match on Saturday, and he's a season ticket holder, mm -hmm. and that's a big sacrifice. So yeah, we're as of now, I'm going to go back home, and I don't plan to go out until Christmas Day because. I want to, you know, have Christmas with my family and particularly with my mother. Yeah, same. Same. It's lovely to see you, Ruth Cabri. Thank nice you for you. talking to us about your campaign and Merry Christmas to you. Now, it is time for the latest in my series of interviews with MPs where we go behind the politics and get to know the real person. I spoke to Shafor McDonough, Labour MP for Mitcham and Morden, about her childhood and about pop music. She talks about her sister Margaret a lot in this interview and since we recorded this interview, her sister Margaret has undergone hospital treatment. We all wish her well with her recovery. I think it was a, it was a, a great childhood. I come from an Irish Catholic sort of family, big families on both sides, lots of aunts and uncles coming and going, cousins, ups, downs, all the rest of it. But my mum and dad were just steadfast, completely reliable. I mean, this is a bit sick making, but every day, either my mum or dad, depending on whether my mum was working because she was a night nurse, they would kneel at the bottom of our bed and we'd say our prayers. So wow. I, when I look back now, I think that's probably what makes both myself and Margaret Margaret's confident. Your sister. And I, I see the trauma now of with families that I deal with of constantly moving of you know, not being kind of reassured by a routine. I think routine's really important for children. Is Catholicism still a big part of your life? Yes. I mean, I'm a, I'm a very liberal Catholic, but I'm a, a church-going Catholic. And it, it kind of is also about my sense of community and belonging and being part of things. You mentioned Margaret, who is your sister, who was a very big figure in the Labour Party... Uh, not a Labour MP like you are, but was a general secretary of the Labour Party. So at what point in your lives did you both decide to commit your lives to the Labour Party? I'm not ever sure that you make decisions like that. You ease into them, don't you? Um, I look back and I think I was just a bit of a gobby teenager and that, um, you know, we would always sit down on a Sunday and my dad would always say, can we not row about the priest's sermon and the answer to that was, of course, no, because we always did row about it. So, you know, it was a house of newspapers. It was a house of watching the news what on the newspapers. Um, the Daily Mirror. Yeah. Uh, and uh, watching the newspaper, you know, reading the newspapers, watching the news, always discussing things. It was kind of very part of that generation of Irish kind of culture. And you live with your sister now. Yeah. Because that's a close relationship. Yes. I, I, I mean, it's hard to tell, isn't it? Because if like, that's your life, you don't see it as unusual or anything. But she's an extraordinary person. And uh, yeah, she prevents, she m m ensures that I live in a civilised fashion because I'm not quite so sure my house would be as nice if she wasn't living in it. You're not, you're not that tidy. I am tidy because I have to be tidy. <laughs> Do you ever miss the fact that you're not in a relationship with with a, a partner? Are you happy living with your sister? I'm happy living the... I mean, I think I've always been fortunate and living the life that I wanted to and got great friends, great family. I love my job. I kind of... You know, sometimes you can look at other people's close personal relationships and just think, oh, God, thank God I'm not, you know. And I suppose I like doing what I'm doing and perhaps I'm selfish. I don't, just don't compromise on that. So you 
are a Blairite. Yes. It is not always that fashionable in the Labour Party. It was certainly like not fashionable in the last sort of almost decade. It might be creeping back into fashion a little bit now. But you have never gone sailed with the political wind in the Labour Party, have you? I suppose it's, it can be the only way that you can be. If you, you know, if that's who you are, that, that's just how you do it. I mean, I kind of passionately believe the Labour Party has got to uh, build a broad coalition, uh, putting together the people who don't have much, together with the people who have something, because without a big, broad message, you're never going to win. Uh, and what I want to do is to win to change the world. The Labour Party can, its worst tendency, it may happen in the other parties too, I don't know, but I, but I know for certain that happens in the Labour Party. It can have elements in it which almost tries to bully you out of your thought process if it is not in fashion at the time. Were you ever subject to that? Did you ever feel hurt by that? I suppose I'm just a bit too belligerent myself to, um, to be like that. I mean, I think you have to be careful because sometimes you know, other people's views are the right ones and you aren't necessarily always right. And But um, I suppose I'm just extraordinarily lucky in that I've got great friends, a great constituency. And so I think often for MPs, they don't actually have a big support network behind them. So they may fear, you know, the period that we've been through may fear losing their job, not being reselected, may fear aggression from their party meetings. Well, you know, I never really had that. So I was just a bit luckier, really. You've had controversial pol political periods. Um, when Tony Blair uh, stood down, or when there were moves to get Gordon Brown in, you, you didn't want Gordon Brown to be the next leader. Do you, what, do you look back on that period after all the, oh God, drama and chaos that has engulfed the Labour Party subsequently, and think, oh, maybe I was a bit harsh. No, <laughs> no. I think um, the point of the Labour Party is to be successful at elections and bring about changes, whether it's taking kids out of poverty or pensioners out of poverty, building hospitals, building houses. That is um, our preeminent purpose. And so, I mean, it's nothing personal in this. I just felt that Gordon Brown was a great chancellor but in the 21st century, and it may be completely unfair that he was going to find it extraordinarily difficult to be a prime minister in a 24-hour news media world where you have to be out there all the time. You can never hide. You always have to have a view and understand that some of the things you decide are just going to go wrong. And I, I think that he is a man of great thought, uh, great ideas, but it's very different being the number one to being the number two, isn't it? And I, I just felt that's where, it, where, well, that wasn't where his skills lied. What would Siobhan McDonough MP be doing as a job now if she wasn't Siobhan McDonough MP? Well, I think I might be signing on. I'm not sure <laughs> that I'm employable. I mean, I, I, uh, prior to being an MP, I worked for a housing association and I ran schemes to help homeless families find accommodation. So hopefully there would be room for me in that sector. Um, I have very few technical skills, which I think make me difficult to employ, but I hope I'd be out there doing something entrepreneurial, kind of on the social side of things. And what do you do? Because, well, first of all, isn't it difficult, because you were elected in 97, that's a long time. Do you feel institutionalised? Is it? Do you have to fight against being institutionalised? Because it is an institution parliament. It is, uh, but I suppose my link to the constituency has always been greater. So I've never really been part of that. You know, you know what it's like. You spend all that time trying to get elected as an MP, and I, I lost in eighty-seven and ninety-two to only want then not to be a constituency MP, but to be a PPS like a, you know. A, kind of an assistant to a minister or be a junior minister or become a minister. And I never really felt driven to do any of that. It's, a bit, it's been, always been about, you know, kind of practical idea about how you could improve things. I mean, I was John Reid when he was Home Secretary and Defence Secretary, his PPS, and that was a great time because he's got such a big brain and so many ideas. Let me make this confession to you. 
I didn't want to do any of that either. I just wanted to be a constituency MP. But the psychology in that place is, well, your mates are getting promoted. Yeah. Why aren't you getting promoted? So, yeah. so I thought, oh, maybe I should get promoted. And then it, you know it's not going to make you happy. It doesn't make you happy. But you, I found it difficult not to stick doing the thing that made me happy, which was being the constituency MP. How do you fight against that massive gravitational pull to, you should be on the ladder, you should be on the ladder? I don't know. I suppose I never thought anybody would put me on the ladder, so it never really bothered me very much. And when Tony Blair was um, uh, Prime Minister and when we had a Labour government, I was just willing it for six, wanted it to be a success. Just, you know, I would go and see him and say, Tony, have I, I've had this idea about antisocial behaviour in the police, or I've had this idea... And he probably thought, oh, not that woman again, you know, about... Uh, so there was always lots to do. And I, I also feel that I was joined the Labour Party in 1976. How old were you? Uh, 16. Uh, and the, you know, things were really bad. You know, we think things are bad now, but things were bad then. And I, I've always thought, how do you make people, encourage people to feel like MPs, politicians, councillors... The Labour Party is there for them. And so that had always been far more something that I thought about and I was more interested in. Um, occasionally, I think, you know, perhaps I should have done it differently, but on the whole. What do you do in your spare time? I've got a very... I mean, I live in the area I was born in, so I've got a big social network. Uh, I go out quite a lot. I am a party animal. We do Northern Soul dance classes every other Sunday. Who's we? Me and Margaret. Do you? Yeah. So Northern Soul Dance Classes, that's where they, like, move their feet, yeah. like, in that, yeah. that... I mean, Yeah, we can't do the backflips or the, you know... But, no. but can you do the the sort of... I don't know, even, even know what, what it's On called. A very, I'm not very good, but it, the great thing about it, we do it at a local church hall for a couple of hours on a Sunday, and it makes you stop thinking about everything else. Yeah. You, you just think about, you know, gosh perhaps I should just put my foot here or there or whatever. And the music's fabulous. So, yeah, no, it's great. When did you start doing that? A few years back, um, we went to Blackpool to the International Northern Soul uh, Finals. Uh, there was about eight or nine of us. And we just went into the beautiful uh, ballroom and people were so nice, so friendly. There were groups of men in their 50s there for the dancing they just got out there and they danced and it was just a revelation yeah is music a big part of your life yeah yeah great entertainment sort of thing yeah do you go to gigs yeah um uh last week went to see rag and bone man uh at what we would call hammersmith odeon but i think is now called the eventum apollo uh um yeah we went to see nile rogers at hampton court back in the summer We'll go and see uh, Trevor Nelson's Christmas Soul Party at the Albert Hall. Yes, yeah. So you're a you're a pop music fan. Yeah. Not classical for you. No, no. <laughs> uh, one of my best friends, Anne, she lives three doors up, and she loves the opera, and she's always threatening to take me to the opera. It would be a complete waste of time. Are you still that same working class girl at heart that you were born uh, into? You like to think so. You like to think your values are there. I mean, clearly life gives you different experiences and introduce. I mean wonderfully give, introduce you to people that you would never have met or travel to places. So you don't stay the same, but hopefully you fundamentally stay close to who you are. Would you ever do Strictly? No, I'm not good <laughs> enough. No, uh, the, uh, the glitter, the sequins, the hair and the makeup, yes. The dancing, not so much. Siobhan McDonough, it's been, it's been really good fun to <laughs> talk to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, you for sharing the real me. You've been watching The Briefing with me, Gloria Di Piero. Thank you for your company, not just on this show, but for this year. Up next, it's on The Money with Liam Halligan and I'll be back with Liam from two. But for now, I will leave you with your weather and wish you a Merry Christmas and see you in 2022. It's time to remind ourselves there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello. Most will have a dry day today and uh, several more dry days to come as well. Lots of cloud around, not a huge amount of sunshine. The winds are fairly light, so that cloud isn't really moving too far, all thanks to an area of high pressure. There is this weather front dangling across the far north of Scotland that will bring some rain at times to Shetland. So a bit damp and drizzly here, but otherwise, as I said, 
vast majority dry. Quite a lot of cloud across Wales, southern England, but we do have some sunshine across eastern England, eastern parts of Scotland. We've had some morning fog as well, and that is taking a while to clear away. Mostly cloudy, but dry across Northern Ireland too. Temperature-wise, well, generally still above average, well above across the south, 11, 12 degrees Celsius, but it is going to turn colder over the next few days. Certainly tonight under clear skies across the east, temperatures will fall away and we will see some thickening fog patches once more. Could be quite dense by the morning, the fog over parts of eastern England, so something to be aware of for Friday morning's commute. Some breaks in the cloud across West Wales and eastern Scotland, certainly allowing some pockets of frost. Uh, but generally where it stays cloudy, temperatures holding up at 6 or 7 Celsius. On to Friday, and again, dry and cloudy does kind of sum it up, but there will be some good spells of sunshine over northern Scotland. West Wales should be generally dry and bright, the north coast of Devon and Cornwall. Further east, pretty grey and dank, I suspect, across eastern England. Some of that fog likely to last all day, and if it does, well, we'll struggle to get to 7 or 8 Celsius. And generally, temperatures just a degree or so down on today's values. Through Friday evening, not a great deal of change. Again, where we've got some clear skies, temperatures will fall sharply and we could see some more fog patches forming. And that's how we go into the weekend, really. That high pressure we saw at the start is still with us. So a lot of dry weather, but a lot of cloudy weather, mist and fog getting thicker through the weekend and also things turning colder. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Join me, Alex Phillips, for the Afternoon Agenda on GB News, Monday to Thursday from 4pm till 6pm. We don't lecture to you or try to tell you what to think. We do a deep delve into a topic with views from across the range of debate, therefore leaving you, the viewer, to make up your own mind. Join me, Alex Phillips, for the Afternoon Agenda on GB News, 4 till 6, Monday to Thursday. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on